everybody, this is Dr. Ben Pearl with Fit For You. Today, I have a great colleague with a great story. It's Dr. Gene Merkin. And Gene, you know, the, the, the topic we're talking about here, there, there's a number of sub-threads, but the main thing that I think is unique to your story is you were on a track to become kind of a big deal and you, you had, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but you were, your dad was a runner, you became a runner. Tell us a little bit about that child prodigy story, because that's what it was. Well, it all starts from your environment, right? So my dad started running for health reasons as he was in a physician. He had the, the honor of having the highest cholesterol in his entire medical class. So he decided he was going to change his life and make himself healthier. And he started running. And the running morphed into competitive marathon running, where he was running 120, 130 miles a week. Um, basically he had every injury known to mankind and any type of athlete. Um, one day, age four years old, I said, I want to go running with you. And the Baltimore sun has a picture of the two of us running across a bridge with about eight inches of snow bundled up like we're Eskimos running. And, and that was when it all started. So my dad realized I had a desire to be with him, run with him, do my own thing. And that morphed into a pretty competitive situation where he coached me from age four, literally, where we started running just for fun to be together, to competing in international uh, competitions from cross country and track. So uh, from there, he did his little sports medicine career and had a radio broadcast career. Um, I Is went that on WMAL, to, uh, WRC, WRC, yeah, in, in DC, and then that, that was syndicated all over the United States and Canada, and uh, it ended up leading to where he wrote a book on sports medicine. And it was basically based on his life with injuries and how he learned to treat these things and then how to prevent these sort of things. So it became his platform to make America healthy and educate people on how to become athletes or weekend warriors without getting injured. Right. And uh, you're a little bashful about it, but you were in Faces in the Crowd in 1971, that, that SAI uh, feature that I assume they still do in their online format and, and magazine format. Tell us uh, how that sort of came about. Well, I was fortunate enough to, to get trained in a way where I had a few world records and some national cross country championships and Sports Illustrated picked up on that and featured me in the faces in the crowd and talked about my accolades. And you know, the funny story about that is that they did a look back um, I forget when the date was, but they went back and looked at, oh, you've done your homework. I want to show it so people can see that this is the seven, this is the uh, 81 feature, but go ahead. Well, in 1981, they went back and they did a look back on um, where people were who had been featured in Faces in the Crowd. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. Some of these child prodigy athletes uh, that were featured in this had burned out. Some had all kinds of physical and mental health issues and some of us still survived and they wanted to find out where we were and so they interviewed me and they said gee tell us about your career in running I said well I was burned out by the time I was in high school and just ran on a local and state level at that point no more international stuff and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me and the interviewer said wow that's really interesting he said he said you look back on that finally I said oh absolutely it gave me the foundation that let me know I could achieve things when I put my mind to it gave me the confidence to move ahead and do the things I wanted to do. And now I'm, I'm where I am because of that. And he says, well, that's really interesting. I said, why do you, you said that twice? Why is that so interesting? He said, well, your father who coached you all these years said it was the worst thing in the world for you because he burned you out and made it so you didn't want to run. I said, oh, that's so far from the truth. So here I had my dad as my coach who got me to where I was feeling guilty that I quit and me thinking, wow, this was great. I've had enough of this. I want to go do other things. It was the greatest experience of my life. And that article was really a wonderful thing for both me and my father, because as we talked about our different interpretations, it brought back some pretty fond memories and really made it. And, and, and I'm sure it was a reconciliation for you guys, too, of uh, a lot of mixed feelings, I'm sure, that go through that father-son coaching, which is a difficult thing and one that usually is typically not well, I should say that. I mean, we just saw the movie about the uh, the, the, the tennis prodigies, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's done, but a lot of people will separate it. I know, I know personally the Halls, uh, Gary Hall Jr. and Sr. and and 
Gary Hall Sr., I think there was some wisdom in, in having Mike Bottom coach Jr. And, and just, you know, just being able to, um, in that particular case, there wasn't as much uh, funneling towards that sport. Now, it, it is funny, too, how stories take a different dimension when you take a quote out of context, because I, you know, doing, doing my part as the uh, journalist, I did, I did find that reference. And the quote that, and, and they might have edited, and it's now in an archival format, so you're not sure if you're seeing the whole bit that they wrote. But the quote that they had is, you said at one point, I just wanted to be a kid. And so sometimes they take a portion of that interview that you did in 81, and then it gives it a different flavor. When in fact, you might have had, like you said, the more expansive viewpoint that it set up a, a pedestal of achievement that you could then platform off of. Well, when you're that involved in your sport, it becomes a full time job in addition to everything else you do. And so there really wasn't an opportunity to be a kid, to to be able to go out and stay out at night and, and go on the weekends and do things. We were traveling all over the country, running in races and things like that. So there really was a desire to go out and be a kid. But again, when I was enough, I had enough, the confidence level said I've had enough, but I walked away without any regrets. And, and now in, in hindsight, greatest thing that ever happened. All good. Now, I, I do want to interject one thing that we had uh, off camera, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a brush with greatness. You met the great Steve Prefontaine, the legendary, you know, uh, made Nike a name. You're going to tell me a little bit about the athletic uh, amateur, amateur athletic union. Tell us about that. So, so uh, my dad started the Baltimore or, or the, the Run for Your Life program in Baltimore when he was a fellow at Hopkins. And that led to the Baltimore Roadrunners Club. And then that led to him being the contact for the AAU on the East Coast. And we, of course, got to know all the big athletes at the time. Um, he passed me off to another coach when I was in junior high school who was at Georgetown Prep at the time. And Mike Horsey uh, was, was very well known throughout the country and, and, and respected. And he got Steve Prefontaine to come to Georgetown Prep to train with us. And here I was maybe 10 years old, nine years old. This was the greatest moment in my life that I was going to get to run with pre, pre Fontaine. And we sat around and we talked for about 10 minutes and he says, okay, let's go. And that was it. He says, enough talk, let's go work out. And he took off. I saw him for about 10 seconds and I never saw him again. He was so far ahead of the rest of us. He went off at a speed that none of us could even see him, let alone keep up with him. And that was my brush with greatness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that would have been cool if you if you had had a photo, and of course he had that uh, gutsy uh, gutsy run that he had uh, in '72, and then grooming for '76. Uh, uh, but but much prior to that, um, you know, had that tragic death in his MG, and and Frank Shorter was the last person to see him as he as he dropped him off uh, after a party. How did that affect you, by the way, when you heard that news? Because you're you know one of your icons, and it probably wasn't that freshly off that meet meeting that you, you know, you're reading this in the news or maybe your dad tells you, you know, I, I, it wasn't like a JFK thing, but for the run community, it was a big thing. I, I'd be surprised if there wasn't one single runner who didn't cry when we heard about that. That was a devastating moment. Yeah. So let's now take it to you as a practitioner. Now, knowing what you've gone through, we're in such a hyper competitive world. Let's face it. I mean, Competition is good. It brings greatness, but it also has its, uh, let's just say, the overcompensating parent that, that wants the, the kid to do what they were never able to do. So how are you dealing with, in your practice, or, or, or even in just so far as any coaching experiences you've had, the child athlete uh, uh, not wanting to compete anymore, burnout, what, looking for a way out, what... And this is huge. I mean, we've got all kinds of things. We've got body dysmorphia, anorexia, suicide, all kinds of things. What, what's, you know, you've been both sides of it. What, what can you distill from your life experience? Three, three kinds of athletes you're going to see. The one is the athlete, young or old, who wants to compete at any cost. Whatever it takes, they're going to get out on that field or on that track, and they're going to perform. They don't want to be hampered by an injury. That's number one. Number two is the athlete, child or adult more of the child, I should say, who's got a parent that's overbearing and they're pushing this kid because that's their ticket to college and the, the parent is living vicariously through the, through the athlete. And then there's the athlete, the, the child athlete, who's not really sure they want to do it. So my question, whenever I have a younger athlete in my practice is evaluating the injury to make sure it's a legitimate injury. 
And even when it is, and mostly when it's not, I don't hesitate to ask the child athlete in front of the parent, do you want to keep running? Do you want to keep playing lacrosse? Do you want to keep playing tennis? Do you want to keep doing ballet or hockey, whatever that sport is? And I looked them in the eyes. And you know, there are times when the kids say, well, I wouldn't mind a break. And all of a sudden, the treatment protocol may take a totally different pathway. Or the parent that says, hey, this kid's got to be out on the field or out on the track in the next two weeks because we got a big event coming up. We have a little discussion about the injury. And of course, if it's a legitimate injury, there is no discussion. They're going to be treated how they need to be treated, whether it's cutting back their competition, putting them in a cast or putting them on crutches, whatever it might be for that injury. But I think the first thing is get into the head of your patient, really your child athlete, most importantly, and find out where they are emotionally. Do they want to be doing this sport? Is this an injury that they are pushing more than it might be because that's their ticket out or is it because they're being overtrained or overusing their part because of their coaching or their parenting and things like that and sometimes you have to play mediator but you can't as a practitioner be afraid to bring that up it's critical no that's great that you're not afraid to confront that and i think a lot of times people will take on the role as a doctor just looking at that aspect and not the psychosocial aspect that is so important so I think that's a great service and a great point that you're bringing up for the doctor, parent, athlete relationship, child athlete relationship. One more thing is I think we're also treating the parents because let's take the example of a child that is going through, let's say, travel soccer and just an injury comes up that might be related to the growth spurt, might be Seavers disease, which for the non uh, healthcare folks is just a growth plate injury that's very common in the back part of the heel bone at about eight to 13 and, and girls get it a little quicker than boys because they mature faster. But let's just say that that happens. And then along the way you're treating that and maybe you're treating a little plantar fasciitis and then you're noticing there's a, a curve in a bowing in the legs but a drop midfoot. And then you point that out to the mom and oh my gosh, it's like you, they just discovered my child is not a child. He's Quasimodo. He's the humpback of Notre Dame. How do you deal with that hot potato, Gene? That's a biggie. Well, that's the old, the terrible line. It is what it is. <laughs> we're, yes. simply, we're, we're simply pointing, pointing out what we see and what we know. And if that's part of the problem, it has to be addressed. And I think there are right ways to do things and the wrong ways to do things. And the beauty of it is, you know, the, if you educate most of the parents, they're going to be on board with it. And I think it starts with making sure your athlete has an issue that, that needs treatment, making sure you're recommending the most appropriate treatment, and then educating both your patient, the child athlete and the parent. And, and I think you're going to find a way out of it. You're going to lose some. They're going to say, I don't like your, your diagnosis or your treatment plan. I'm going to get a second opinion. And, and you know what? That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But our yeah. job primarily is protect our patient and do what's best for our patient, even if we alienate the parent. And if it means losing the patient to do the right thing, I think we'll all step up and do that. Yeah, of course. And I think what you also mentioned, which is a good one, you have to make sure you are really focusing on that education uh, moment, because if there is a lapse in the delivery of what they are conveying, it then becomes scary. So somewhere along the sequence, you go A, B, C, D, but somehow you kind of go quickly through C and then they're D and then it's just the emotional component registers with the parent and, and they get very, very fearful. Like, oh my gosh, how, how could I have done this to my, you know, they're, they're concerned because they waited so long, but then when you point it out, it's like, you're kind of like kill the messenger sometimes, which happens, which happens as you mentioned. So well, you gotta be agile. Yeah, the, the fun part is if you use an example for our non-medical people watching Seaver's disease or any kind of these growth plate injuries or growing, I say growth plate, growing pain injuries that, that children will get along the way, which are normal. The fun part to really get to where your athlete, your child athlete is and the parent is, you know, sometimes I'll tell them, you know, if we treat this heel pain, it's going to go away in six months. And if we don't treat this heel pain, it's going to go away in six months. So the good news is all the data shows if you want to play through this, you can. It's going to hurt, but it's not going to make this injury hang around longer. We only have to worry if you're compensating to protect this, that you might hurt something else. And that might change our dynamics. And when you get into that kind of discussion that 
This is an injury that will go away if we treat it or don't treat it, sometimes in the same amount of time with growing, in growth, growing pains and growing problems like that. That's where you get the discussion going of how badly does the kid want to play and how badly does the parent want the, the athlete to be involved. So I think that's a great way to broach it. Now, I know that you also have been involved with some uh, expert handling of, you know, kind of staying out of trouble for uh, coaching doctors. Uh, that's uh, another hat that you've worn uh, over the years. Let's just take some examples, or you could, could be generic. You don't have to say anything specific. But in that athlete that wants to press, you, you, and, and they're not quite ready, and you, you either may have been involved in some situations yourself or known cases that you've been on advisory with, give us maybe sort of a sense of that, let's just say, you know, the classic North Dallas 40, everybody that's of our age group has heard about that movie. The guy gets injected with, you know, in the hammies to keep him in the game. Next thing you know, he ruptures the hamstring because the court is in. What are some things that you've come across in your career, either directly or indirectly, that might be a different twist that uh, we might not normally think of? Well, I mean, there are those. That we have Olympic skaters who've been to see me who have uh, a stress fracture, who are going to compete with that stress fracture. And the key is evaluating the value. So here we had an athlete in our practice who had the trials coming up, had to skate, had to go. So we did things to pad protect. And as long as the risk was understood to this person, in this case, it was worth it. Qualified, got a medal, all's good. There are some calculated risks you're going to make. Rupturing a tendon, yeah, that's that's happened out there. We've had athletes who came to us who wanted that injection, went to another doctor, came back for that tendon rupture treatment. No thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we decided well, not to treat that person. No, that's good that you uh, you dodged a bullet in one case and in another case where it was much more uh, appropriate not to give the cortisone shot. You did not feel pressured to do that, so you kind of kept uh, your Hippocratic oath in that regard. Well, I think, and that and that's what we try to remind the parents or that adult athlete. Hey, you run this risk, and and if you give people the education part, again, we're coming back to education, the risk and the benefit, let them weigh that as an adult, as a pediatric patient, no way, but you're going to have to draw the line as a practitioner. You know, it's an awesome thing to treat a professional athlete or an Olympic athlete or what have you, a local legend, a sportscaster, and that's all great until there's a problem. And so you have to decide really where do you draw the line and, and you got to go to bed at night feeling good about yourself and doing something to please a patient in any situation is usually going to cause trouble doing something that's right for the patient almost never causes a problem absolutely and your gut kind of knows i will throw out and i, I know you like clinical data but uh PEMF might be enough. i just have to spit that out the pulse electric magnetic field as, as you know, approved for delayed fracture unions since 1979. Now they've got uh, bigger Gauss office-based units that can accelerate fracture healing. It's great to have betting though. You're, you're in, a, in a practice with US uh, foot and ankle that, that uh, puts a lot of stock in. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's great that you have that structure of betting. What it sometimes doesn't allow is to be where I'm a single horse operation. I can see something working. I can, I can you know, read some case studies on it, bring it into my practice without the layer. So I guess there's advantages and disadvantages of both in, in that regard, I would have to say. Absolutely. And if you look at the bigger picture, any treatment that's going to address inflammation is usually going to help. There are now studies out there talking about vetted that show that an anti-inflammatory diet is going to help somebody with plantar fasciitis or an Achilles tendonitis. There are so many things that we can do that control inflammation and not by medicines per se that may reduce healing time or promote healing. So anybody that can knock something without trying it doesn't get a lot of credibility in my book. Somebody who's willing to try these new things and show at logic with logic how something works has, has my ear. And I think that's the key here. 
there are treatments that are coming for we have shockwave treatments we have pimp we have all these things that are actually meant to create an inflammation to make you heal better or reduce inflammation to make you heal better and there's going to be some crossroads where these intersect and i think every athlete every lay person has to discuss these things with their doctor and when somebody's passionate about it and can tell a patient in their terms why this might be work it has to be considered that's cool hey so I want to fast forward. You did an interesting path with your life. Just moving forward here. You hit the half century mark. You decided you wanted a different lifestyle, maybe for health reasons too. Tell me a little bit about that. You had a big well, practice shift. Well, we did. I practiced in Montgomery County for 32 years. Uh, my wife and I moved to Annapolis, empty nest. Um, we did a commute back and forth um, for five years. And uh our group had an office in Annapolis that needed some guidance because one of the doctors was leaving. And our COO at the time said, hey, Gene, you live in Annapolis, right? And I said, yes. He said, how would you like to move and go to Annapolis and work there? He says, that's only going to be about a 10 minute drive, right? And this is versus my hour and 15 minutes in the Capitol Beltway of DC every morning and every way home. Kind of amazing. I took, took, I took the offer and, and did. I switched to Annapolis. Um, uh, first night getting ready to leave, I called my wife and said, okay, I'm on my way. She says, how long is it going to take? I said, I don't know. There are a lot of taillights in front of me. Ah, 12 minutes. I think there's a lot of traffic. And that's <laughs> when I knew I made the right decision, but it was also kind of fun because I left all my referral sources, all the people who were part of my practice for 32 years and had to start from scratch. And that was probably a really good shot of invigoration to realize how special it is what we get to do. And to get fired up and try to rebuild and regain the volume and flow you had made me go back to basics. And uh, it was a real positive thing. If there's one thing you could pass on as a nugget to, for someone, let's say they want to go East Coast, West Coast. I've had it with the East Coast. I'm going to Portland, Oregon, or I'm, you know, or do just like what you did local within uh, an hour and a half, uh, but a big uh, commute differential. What would that one nugget be on other than? kind of stepping off and, oh my gosh, I'm jumping 12 feet into the water off the rock ledge. I mean, you just have to jump, but what's the other thing that you would add to that that you've kind of learned along the way in terms of, you did get that newness, that that new, you know, that variety of having to recreate. So there's that with the fire in your belly, but what, what did you take wisdom wise to sort of develop it? Well, I'll, I'll flip that a different way. Went back to work for Special Olympics two weekends ago and got to work with the Special Olympians. And you talk about rewarding. That's the takeaway. Whether you're driving 15 minutes or whether you're driving an hour and 15 minutes or whether you live when you're office building, getting up and doing what you get to do is your motivation. So where you do it is important because you got to like getting up in the morning and going to work. But remembering what we get to do is what should motivate all of us to be happy and, and, and go after where we want to be. I think that's that's our sayonara right there. That is uh, that's a really good piece of advice. Any any other last words that you want to say to pass on to the profession or just about you know your own personal story that you'd like to say? Well, I think everybody has a niche and find your niche, go with a vengeance be happy and share the love and your practice will grow. And to all the patients out there, find a doctor who wants to listen, who will work with you and teach you what you need to do to prevent coming back. <laughs> I think that's the key there. Well, Jane, I was in West Virginia for four, four and a half days and you got a much better tan than I do. And so kudos to you. I, I think, think my collar is too tight. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing this and uh, uh, look forward uh, down the road, maybe in a few years to see how things are, are continuing to shape up for you and your practice in Annapolis. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Good talking. All right.